Well, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to the eighth meeting of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Could I remind, remind members and others to turn off mobile phones and uh, blackberries, please? Um, I would welcome George as well as his uh, first meeting as a full member uh, of the committee, George Adam. <coughs> so welcome, sure. George. <laughs> Agenda item one. Uh, the, the first item today is for the committee to agree to take agenda item six in private. Now, this item is to discuss the committee's consultation on the parliamentary reform review. Do members agree to take it in private? Yeah, thank you. Agenda item two is um, to take evidence on the draft public services reform. Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland, etc., Order 2013. We have the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, John Swinney, here today with his officials, Sam Anwar, the Team Leader for Public Bodies Unit, and Stuart Fubister, Divisional Solicitor Director for Legal Services. Um, <coughs> could I welcome the Cabinet Secretary uh, and uh, your officials to the meeting, and if uh, I could invite you, Cabinet Secretary, to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. The draft order, if approved, would, from the 1st of July 2013, establish a Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. The single Commissioner will replace the Commission for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland and its two members, the Public Standards Commissioner for Scotland and the Public Appointments Commissioner for Scotland. The Commission for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland was established by the Scottish Parliamentary Commissions and Commissioners etc Act 2010. The Commission is a Scottish Parliamentary corporate body, a supported body. Its functions include the investigation of complaints about members of the Scottish Parliament, councillors and members of public bodies, and the regulation of public appointments. In January 2012, the presiding officer, on behalf of the SPCB, requested that Scottish Ministers bring forward an order to restructure the Commission for Ethical Standards in Public Life and to merge the roles of Public Standards Commissioner for Scotland and the Public Appointments Commissioner for Scotland, and that is the purpose of the order before the committee today. The Public Standards Commissioner for Scotland and the Public Appointments Commissioner for Scotland both operate within a statutory framework. This framework promotes ethical standards in public life in Scotland. There is considerable synergy between the Commissioner's functions respective functions in relation to the enforcement of codes of conduct and codes of practice are similar, as are functions in relation to scrutiny and compliance. The staff of the Commission who assist the Commissioners to perform their respective functions also work closely together. Bringing the functions together under a single Commissioner would increase the opportunity for economy and efficiency, of, for efficiency and economy of scale. It would also offer the prospect of a more effective public service with a single access point for the public. The new Commissioner would be expected to perform the functions of that office without any detriment to levels or standards of service. In fact, the current Public Standards Commissioner and, in his capacity, Acting Public Appointments Commissioner for Scotland has been performing the role of the new Commissioner since June 2012 with the same support staff and with no diminution of levels or standards of service. The draft order was laid in Parliament and went out to public consultation between the 18th of January 2013 and the 29th of March 2013. An analysis report of responses has been published and is available on the Scottish Government website. Responses to the proposal to have a single Commissioner have been positive. We have taken on board the point raised by the Commission for Ethical Standards in Scotland and have amended the order to maintain the present position relative to which statements are absolutely privileged for the purposes of the law of defamation. Two organisations commented about the freedom of information arrangements for the new body. Uh, they felt that the new authority should be designated as a Scottish public authority for the purposes of freedom of information. We agree in principle with this proposal, but feel it needs to be discussed further with the relevant bodies concerned. Um, I would welcome the opportunity um, today, Convener, to answer any questions that the Committee may have on the order that is on the agenda today. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and as the Cabinet Secretary has said, uh, members have a copy of the, uh, the uh, consultation uh, document responses. Do members have uh, any questions they would like to put to the Cabinet Secretary or his officials? Uh, Dick? Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, 
Could you please advise the committee what the costs presently are for the commissioner or the commission the, and what the savings would be? The, the, the current costs are um, £64,000 in relation to the uh, costs of the existing um, commissioner arrangements around the, 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 the actual office holders involved. And we expect there to be net savings of up to £44,000 per annum as a consequence of the introduction of this order. And what is the current cost of the whole department on average per annum? Uh, of the whole function, I don't have that, that uh, total cost to hand, uh, Mr Lyle, but I'm certainly happy to supply it to the committee. Would I be wrong in saying half a million pounds? Um, that... Uh, maybe of that order, but uh, these are these are parliamentary corporate body costs, which are, are not, you know, the, the government obviously underpins and provides the parliamentary corporate body functions, but they're not budgets that I control uh, no. or manage. Uh, so I would have to provide the necessary information through the parliamentary corporate body to uh, assist in answering that question. And my last question, do you know how many complaints they investigated um, last year? In relation to the... Um, complaints about councillors or members of public bodies. The latest data for which I have information available is 2011-12 and the total number of cases was 185. Um, in relation to the um, complaints about members of the Scottish Parliament, again for 2011-12 that was uh, 16 complaints that were investigated. Um, I should say that in relation to the complaints made against councillors and members of the public body of public bodies, um, these have been falling since. But well, in 2019, the number was 200. It has fallen in 2011-12 to 185, and the complaints about members of the Scottish Parliament fell from a figure in 2009-10 of 37 to a total of 16 in 2011-12. Um, so I, th I think that puts into now obviously the, the public standards commissioner um, investigates uh, all of these complaints and there is a uh, any complaint that is considered to require reference to another body in the case of the complaints about uh, councillors and members of public bodies those would go to the standards commission for Scotland and obviously in relation to members of the Scottish Parliament it's a different route and <laughs> through you, convener, if you could possibly su supply the committee the total cost of the department at some Thank you. We certainly will uh, provide Thank that. Thank you. Hey Dick, I'm happy with that. Uh, any other members with questions? Cabinet Secretary, um, j just one point I think I would like to um, pick up with you. Uh, on the, the, the responses to the consultations, uh, there was one point about uh, designating the, the whole new authority uh, as a Scottish public authority for the public uh, for the purposes of the Freedom of Information Scotland uh, Act and uh, you've said that you agree with this proposal but feel it should be carried out under FOI legislation in the future rather than as part of the order. Could you maybe explain your reasoning for that? I think the uh, the, the I'll maybe ask Stuart Fubisar to, to perhaps go through. Some, I'll ask Stuart Fubisar to, to perhaps answer some of those points, Convener, because I, I suspect they will relate to what's the most appropriate instrument to be yep. amended. But I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. Um, what we have done by way of this order is really to maintain the status quo on freedom of information, uh, which was that for um, public appointments function that was subject to FOI for the uh, standards work it wasn't. Um, so in paragraph 10 of Schedule 2 to the order. The Freedom of Information um, Scotland Act 2002 is amended to maintain the status quo, um, to extend um, coverage to uh, the standards work uh, is obviously a, a change, a step further. We have the power to do that by order under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, I think the thought was we'd examine it a bit further, um, further uh, consultation with the Information Commissioner, and then if the decision is still to to, to make that extension, we do it through the Freedom of Information order. W would you have any idea of when you might be looking at that again? Um, it isn't a long process necessarily, um, perhaps after recess. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, no other questions from, from members? Well, thank you very much indeed for that. And if we can <coughs> move on to uh, the next agenda item, which is agenda item three. Uh, <coughs> and it is for the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth, uh, John Swinney, to move motion S4M 06606. Uh, so I would ask you to so move, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, formally moved. Convenient. Formally moved. Thank you very much. Um, can I invite any further comments from members at this stage? No, no further uh, comments. Um, the committee will be asked to um, produce a short report outlining our uh, consideration of the order in due course. Um, and I'd be happy if members would agree that I could sign off that. Uh, also agree the motion. Sir. Agree the motion, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, in due course. Uh, and uh, could we now uh, agree the motion? Agreed. Thank you very much. That's the, um, the business concluded. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary and officials. <coughs> Could we just suspend for a couple of minutes just to allow for uh, a wee bit of a change here? much uh, members we will uh, resume the, <coughs> the committee meeting we are now moving on to agenda item four um, we're taking evidence on our inquiry into post legislative scrutiny and I would like to welcome our witnesses uh, here uh, this morning we have Don Peebles the policy and technical manager of the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy we have uh, Mark Roberts the Portfolio Manager for the Performance Audit Group of Audit Scotland. And we have um, where's Andy? Andy Miles, uh, the Parliamentary Office for Scottish Environment Link. <coughs> now, the evidence session, as you'll see, is a, is a round table session to, to hopefully generate a, a good interaction between the committee and our witnesses this, this morning. Um, we are just going to move straight into the discussion rather than have any kind of um, opening statements. We've got fairly limited time this morning. We've got till 11.30 and a number of different things to get through. So I would invite um, members to ask uh, any questions that they have of our witnesses. Who would like to begin? No one. <laughs> <laughs> right, if you want to okay. uh, convene our kick-off, Mark uh, Roberts from Audit Scotland, um, can you explain your, the comment, your performance and cost of a particular public service against which the impact of legislation can be assessed? What do you mean by that? What we're, what we're trying to get at there is saying if, if there's going to be a legislative change to one particular part of um, a public service or how a service is delivered, um, you'd be looking for some baseline information to know how much is it costing currently, what's some basic performance data against which you've got a quantitative measure to assess that change. As we've said in our submission, um, a fairly frequent and recurrent um, characteristic of our reports is kind of um, commentary on the poor quality of um, data that exists. Um, so that is a challenge in doing that, but you're basically looking for something about against which you can compare um, change as a result of legislation against where you were before. 
So the, what, what you're basically suggesting is that if we look at either department, as we have just looked at, um, you were sitting in the gallery for my, my question, uh, based on the value of what we're getting from uh, the Commissioner. Um, so we look at a department, see how best it's working, see what it's doing, and then assess and see if it's value for money. Is that what you really yes. get that? So, so in the example you were just talking about with the Cabinet Secretary, if you were looking at um, the role of the Commissioner now, and you were looking at a legislative change, how much is it costing, what is performance like now, so you can make some kind of quantitative assessment of the change that has resulted as due to the legislation. Thank you. Okay. Any other members? Uh, Fiona? Could I just pursue that a wee bit further and ask, do you envisage that being part of le primary legislation when we pass it, that every piece of legislation that's passed has to have a section in it that says you must collect data on this? I think, as we suggested, that there's, there's probably a kind of um, balance to be struck between kind of which pieces of legislation are, are actually addressed in the, this way. Um, it's probably beyond the capacity of, of the, the Parliament and its committees and certainly Audit Scotland and others to, to review um, performance and change against every piece of legislation that the Parliament passes. Um, it's, I think that's been a recurrent theme in a number of written submissions that the, the committee has, has received, is that there will have to be some, some selectivity about which pieces of legislation um, could be identified as um, meriting post-legislative scrutiny. Um, but certainly what we're, what we're suggesting is that as a starting point, you would like to have some reassurance that there was good data about the way the service was currently being um, delivered, both in terms of performance and financial information. Other members want to follow up on that at all? No, okay. Um, I, I would like to um, ask uh, Don, um, Don over here, my apologies, uh, from, from SIPFA. SIPFA um, you, you've mentioned that you've designed uh, and recommend a principle based but practical integrated scrutiny model which tests legislation from the draft stage. Would you like to maybe elaborate a wee bit on that and uh, let us know exactly what? what you mean by that and what your model entails. Indeed, Convener, thanks uh, very much for that. Thanks for the opportunity to come along uh, this morning. In our submission, uh, we did set out, um, as you rightly described, an integrated model um, on the basis that uh, we seem to be at the position where everybody agrees that uh, post-legislative scrutiny is a good thing. I don't think we're debating whether or not to have it. I think that uh, the issue at hand is how it should actually look. At the Institute, as far as we're concerned, we, we strongly believe that uh, the commencement for post-legislative scrutiny, uh, for that to be effective, is to have good pre-legislative scrutiny, in effect, so that there is clarity just about uh, the extent to which uh, the, uh, the legislation is fit for purpose and if it's actually required. The principles that we've actually set out are actually threefold. We actually think that we should be looking at the legislation in terms of value for money. We should be looking at uh, priority and we should be looking at affordability as well. And in the, 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 yeah, the schematic that we actually included within our evidence, we actually set out um, additional items of information within that, uh, that model. The legislative scrutiny, therefore, would actually commence in advance of the legislation being passed by Parliament. It would actually be subjected to scrutiny on an ongoing basis throughout the life of the, the new service or throughout the life of the legislation or throughout of the, the service change and uh, what have actually applied to. Uh, there'd be a clear link to the budgetary process in, in that uh, there'd be a cost or costs or indeed savings associated with that and committees and government uh, will wish to, to monitor that. And then after a set period of time, there'd be a formal post-legislative scrutiny process within the principles that are actually set out um, such that there is a clear model for the, the process to, to be undertaken. We actually trialled this process with the National Assembly for Wales in the budget process last, uh, last year, um, and initial evidence is that so far it actually works. What this actually means is that uh, you've actually taken a view on legislation and the process on a wider and more holistic basis rather than just at the end of a process, having set out a range of metrics and uh, information that's actually going to be, be required. I've actually brought a long schematic with me, which I'm happy to, to pass out, which would be of use to committee members. 
Is this the, the schematic that was included in your um, That's the one. submission to yeah. us? Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, and in terms of uh, the work you've done with the Assembly of Wales, that was specifically related to one particular aspect of it. Uh, was it the financial? Uh, it was a review of the, the budget uh, uh, for 2012-13. Mm. And, 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 and are they thinking about rolling that out to indeed. other aspects of yeah, their work as well? What they actually see is that the, the impact of that, whilst it was actually trial on the budget, has um, benefits and advantages for, for everything. And whilst we're actually calling it uh, financial scrutiny, if we just use the, the word scrutiny, Clearly, mm -hmm. that can actually be applied on a on a wider basis. Mm -hmm. The uh, the convener of the, the finance committee um, formally on record has actually um, identified the extent to which she was challenged to think differently and in a wider sense. And it's actually made the not only the committee but assembly members think differently about their role <coughs> as last scrutineers as uh, assembly members. Uh -huh. Uh, and in terms of if, if you're, you're recommending that, that we adopt something yeah. similar, yeah. Um, how would we go about that in a practical sense? Uh, obviously, they've picked one area and yeah. then the, 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 they've tested it on that, I suppose. Yeah. Is that what you would be recommending that we do? And would you have any <coughs> particular area in mind that we should focus in on? I think that, um, I suppose there's a number of things. If we go back to what is the, the commencement of the, the scrutiny process, um, which um, I'll probably emphasise should be on um, more robust pre-legislative scrutiny so that, in effect, that when we actually get to the point, the end point, as it were, of post-legislative scrutiny, uh, there is greater clarity on just exactly what uh, is going to be looked at and the extent to which that legislation will be assessed and indeed when. So the, the key point probably is going to be more robust scrutiny at uh, the legislative and the pre-legislative uh, point. The, uh, the principles can actually be applied to, in essence, any piece of legislation or any form of uh, regulatory change because I suppose that uh, the type of legislation we're talking about could either be primary legislation or it could be by regulation and there's a significant amount of change actually uh, comes up as a consequence of regulation which might never come formally before any of the, the committees. It can be applied to, to that. And to answer the question as to how and uh, that uh, should be applied, um, I don't actually see that this will necessitate a change to say the formality of standing orders as such. Um, I don't see anything in standing orders that precludes this. It could perhaps be something that's done by guidance and it could actually be for the, the committee itself to actually provide a form of guidance to each individual committee, each subject committee, to actually undertake this and this forward within that, uh, that model, um, <coughs> including uh, the, uh, the timescales for pre- and ongoing and post-legislative scrutiny as well. Yeah, thank you. I should have said earlier, yeah. by the way, that Sarah Jane Lane from Scottish Lands and Estates has put in her apologies. So. Um, I mean, other members who have come along to give evidence, if you want to, you know, contribute to any of this, just feel free, just just, just do that. The members, uh, John. Um, just thinking about the Welsh um, model, how long has that been going on for? Uh, it was last autumn that uh, we introduced it. So less, less than a year. Correct. Right. That's absolutely right, yeah. And what's the um, Welsh government, is it, executive? How, how do they view this, this process? I mean, I would have thought that... You know, some some of these um, outcomes, for example, have the objectives been achieved? If the, outcome, if the answer to that was no, I might I, I perhaps think that the government would be uncomfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. they've been receptive to this process. They, they would be challenged as a consequence of it. Uh, my uh, anecdotally, my, my sense was that uh, the government were, were challenged differently um, as a consequence of of that. Um, it was I'd stress the the budget process and the uh, the success criteria for. Uh, scrutiny of the, the budget process was, was different to actually what it is now. What we've actually encouraged the, uh, the, the Finance Committee to actually do was to, to adopt a wider consideration of what they should actually be looking at uh, rather than actually get immersed in the detail of specific policy is to actually take that step back against the principles and consider that, meaning that the, the type of questions that were asked of the, the, uh, the, the, um, the Finance Minister were, was different to what had actually been asked in the past. Um, were they uncomfortable? Probably. They were, they were actually getting asked different questions 
Um, you're right to say it's less than a year, so the full cycle has mm. not yet been completed. But what this uh, has actually introduced um, to the committee who are adopting this is that they're recognising that uh, budget scrutiny, rather than just be about scrutiny for the introduction of the budget, means that there is a role throughout the financial year and ongoing, in effect. Mm. So this will be a longer term process, as we would actually recommend for the type of legislative scrutiny. Um, you would be implementing in any event. Okay. Andy, I think, did you want to come in on the same point? Or? Uh, I wanted to come in simply to say that uh, from the point of view of um, voluntary organisations in the environment sector, I uh, quite strongly support the, the, the model that Dawn is outlining. But um, just to make sure that people understand that this is about the principles of financial scrutiny and that... Um, it is not necessarily going to capture in the model uh, policy scrutiny of the pursuit of uh, a policy of um, the biodiversity strategy or a fresh water strategy or a strategy which is actually producing something which is not monetized and that there is so much of the work of the parliament that we're involved which isn't monetized and therefore doesn't nicely fit into this model. Yeah, I think Andy is right to, to offer that, uh, that, that challenge and uh, whilst it was in, introduced initially as uh, financial scrutiny and for that purpose, what we uh, actually undertook was an assessment of the extent to which it could be applied uh, to legislation per se, um, to the extent that we actually eliminated one of the, uh, the principles of financial scrutiny from that model that we're promoting uh, here today and was in our, uh, our submission. Uh, our sense is that uh, the, the principles that we've actually set out can actually be, be applied. Um, and, and whilst it may well be that, that not everything uh, can actually be applied uh, or can be considered in, in a financial sense, the passing of legislation is a cost to Parliament. It's not an inexpensive process. And I think it has to be clear, irrespective of what the, the outcome or output from legislation actually is, is that um, parliamentarians can and should be clear about the rationale, the reason for that, and that uh, the prioritisation has been applied, and that you're actually going to get uh, value for money from that uh, legislation in whatever sense that actually um, appears. But I do accept the, the challenge, and uh, the principles are, are for discussion, and I think that the benefit of this uh, session here today is that uh, it gives us something to, to talk about and to perhaps take forward. Here. Yeah, I mean, we're obviously at the very early stages of looking at where we want to go with this, and uh, I think there may have been a perception that post-legislative scrutiny was, was a very simple, straightforward thing, where you look at a piece of legislation so many years after it's uh, be, been implemented and, and see just how it's been working. And there has been some work like that done in the Parliament over the last 13, uh, 14 years. Not an awful lot, really, and that's why we were keen to have a look. But what you're suggesting here, all of you, is that this needs to be broadened out um, and, and looked at pre-legislative, during the legislation, post-legislative, not just financial, but policy as well. Um, that, that's a lot of work. That's a big, big range of things that we're, we're looking at here. So that sort of takes me on, I think, to the issue of, of resources. As you'll know... Um, I think in one of the submissions it's mentioned that there are 129 MSPs and when you take uh, cabinet secretaries, ministers, uh, opposition leaders and so on out of it, you know, you're down to about 100 or less who are able to service parliamentary committees. We've got, I think, 16 committees at the moment. We've got over 80 cross-party groups and a whole host of other things and constituencies to look after as well. So would you have any suggestions for us as to how we would find the space in our timetable and the resource to actually do what you're suggesting? Because what you're leading us towards is a very big piece of work. Uh, Fiona, do you want to come in? Sorry. Yeah, can I just kind of add to that? Because I think it's interesting that in talking about post-legislative scrutiny, you're saying that there's pre-legislative that sets the foundation and it is about the resources. I'm quite interested when, when you talk through that and then I think about the stages of, of uh, legislation that we have at the moment. And I think we do have pre-legislative scrutiny. That's what stage one's about. Um, and when you're seeing your affordability prioritisation value for money, I think we're doing that already because you have to look at the financial memorandum that goes with any 
bill that's introduced. Um, we have, you know, like impact assessments um, that have to be done before a bill can be introduced. So it's interesting. We're very, we keep coming back to post-legislative scrutiny it will be resource intensive, but we're actually doing a lot of it already anyway. And a lot of the things that you've talked about today, I would have said we are doing it but under slightly different headings. Is it just that we're not doing it well enough? Or do we have to change it completely the way that you're thinking about? Um, I think that you're quite right that you're doing all of these tasks already. Um, Parliament is doing them and they're doing them the best of the ability. But as the convener has said, you're, you're 129 MSPs minus uh, 15 of approximately on average, which leaves you with an extraordinarily large job to do. Um, in fact, I mean, if you consider the scrutiny role that this Parliament pick, uh, has compared with uh, Westminster, um, they have hundreds and hundreds of MSPs who can sit on scrutiny committees. Uh, indeed, they have committees dedicated purely to scrutiny. Now, that model is not, and I don't think ever was going to function with the size of the Parliament that we have. And uh, in an earlier SPPA uh, investigation, I, I, I caused laughter by suggesting, well, one of the ways out of it was to get more MSPs uh, and acknowledge that, of course, that in uh, the current circumstances, that's highly unlikely. But I think there are other ways which we've suggested in our evidence where um, this workload can be tackled better. And it's about using the resources that you have to tackle the, uh, the, 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 the task of scrutiny as, 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 as well as possible. Um, I think people will have taken from the, from the Environment Link evidence that we are critics to an extent of the way that scrutiny is being handled. And the, the first thing to say is that um, we're uh, of the view having reviewed the uh, agenda of Parliament and its committees that actually you've been handed vast amounts of legislation to pass and that Parliament should give consideration, our parliamentarians should give consideration as to whether in fact too much of your time is dealt up with legislation and pre-legislative scrutiny. Committees, particularly in the field of the environment, but in other fields as well, have had so much legislation to pass since 1999 that there has been very little time actually left for scrutiny of government. A point that which we make is that all scrutiny of government is effectively financial scrutiny because all government expenditure has to be based on a legal basis. In other words, it has to be based on a piece of, 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 of legislation. But you also have that task which I was mentioning uh, in references to Don's comments and, and, and his model, that you have to look at the value for money, the effectiveness, what's actually being produced from the legislation. And our view is that um, Parliament, and in the course of this review, we hope that you will be able to look at um, setting aside some sort of guidance to the subject committees to make sure that some of their time is protected for the purposes of scrutiny, for the purposes of post-legislative scrutiny or inquiry into policy areas, which at present under the standing orders is not the case. We, we also uh, agree entirely with Fiona MacLeod that the, 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 the resource question here is crucial. And, and <clears throat> I think that it's worth looking at the experience of the Scottish Parliament over, over, over the, the, the first three sessions and the, the, the two years of the current session to, to ask whether, in fact, you as the members of the committees have enough expertise and advice and enough time in which to uh, draw on the expertise and advice of those in the rest of civic society and of your own advisers, including, of course, SPICE, but also in the advisers that you appoint to committees. And I have to say that our view is that you don't. You don't have enough in the way of support and advice to do your prop job properly. And I think that the Parliament, when it passes the next budget, um, should look seriously at making sure that this Parliament is properly financed with the advice 
and the expertise that is actually required to do the job of scrutiny. And a third suggestion which we make in our evidence, which I think is pertinent to your question, Mr. Convener, is to say that when the Scottish Parliament was in the process of being set up through the Constitutional Convention and then the, the all-party uh, Constitutional Steering Group, a um, great deal of work was put into looking at the Scandinavian parliaments, uh, similar legislatures to this, the Scottish Parliament that was proposed in uh, the United States of America and in uh, Australia and Canada uh, and other places, and looking at their practice to try and uh, get the, the furnishings of the Parliament, if not its architecture, right as to how the Parliament was actually working. And we suggest that it uh, might be time to have another good look at how um, other legislatures, uh, similar in size to the Scottish Parliament, actually deal with this balance between legislation and scrutiny because you have two huge functions there, and how you actually fit them into your timetable, uh, you don't have the luxury of being able to divide into scrutiny committees and legislative committees the way that huge legislatures do. But there are others who have got experience of this. Um, and we find this through uh, contact with colleagues from uh, across the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, we recently hosted a meeting of uh, parliamentary officers from the environment links in uh, Belfast, Cardiff and London, but also in, in, in our work through the IUCN, the European Environment Bureau, when we talk with our colleagues in other parts of the world. And there are different models to the model that has been used here. And reviewing that model and doing some research uh, into what happens elsewhere may be a good place to start. John first and then Don. I just wanted to pick up on this uh, workload point. Um, if the scrutiny process is working properly, surely the argument then goes that there's some legislation, some bill, some acts, which wouldn't then be enacted because it will fail during the scrutiny process and governments will be more or less inclined to bring forward um, legislation which they think may not meet the scrutiny test. And I just wondered if what the panel members thought about that. Can I pick um, up on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that, too, absolutely. And I think it um, also picks up uh, Fiona's point about um, what's actually done currently. And you're right to um, highlight the, the legislation process uh, that you go through in terms of scrutiny at the moment, the financial memorandum at stage one. All of that fits neatly into what we're proposing by way of the, the model. Um, it's not distinct uh, nor different from, from that. I suppose that the, the challenge that should maybe rightly be brought to bear is, is the extent to which um, it's been scrutinised effectively by all uh, parliamentarians and, and committee members against the background of the limited resources and time that you actually have in effect. I suppose for Parliament the, the main instrument of change that uh, you actually have is legislation and when that legislation actually comes along and it's assessed in terms of the requirements of, of stage one um, what our assessment tends to tell us is that uh, we see less of a consideration of where the case for that legislation um, has been made robustly by government when it's actually brought along and the extent to which uh, um, existing legislation where it is in place has actually performed or not performed in effect, um, which is probably absent from uh, maybe stage one consideration um, at, the, at the moment, not in every respect, uh, but you will see differences amongst the subject committees in that you will see differences in the format of the work programmes, for example. Uh, you won't see um, in most um, work programmes, um, apart from difference in structure, um, post-legislative scrutiny um, at all. In effect, it tends to be uh, inquiries. I think that uh, the, uh, the issue about workload, in part, I think, can be determined by different planning for individual uh, uh, committee um, work plans. You've got limited resources. You're always going to have limited resources, and it's about the extent to which and how you actually use them uh, currently. Um, I absolutely agree about the point that uh, the, uh, the, the scrutiny on the pre-legislative basis, it may well... Um, have the consequence of limiting or making the legislation which comes along subsequently a lot more effective. That's probably going to be a, a longer term or medium to, to longer term impact, but that's undoubtedly, certainly in our view, what one of the consequences will be. And that will have a direct impact thereafter on the workload of the, the individual um, committees. Um, you're right to actually set out 
the the, le the, yeah, the level of uh, work that you actually have, and I sympathise with the committee members when you set it out like that, uh, convener. Uh, the suggestion that you uh, propose or that we propose even more, um, I think I can understand why that does not sit uh, comfortably. But I think it's perhaps a case of, of planning and determining uh, the, the priorities of the, the committee going forward within the, the limited time scale that uh, you, you actually have. And if there was a clearer structure um, to what uh, the, the scrutiny is proposed for individual committees, perhaps set by the, this committee, um, I think that would bring clarity what everyone was expected to, to actually do. Are you suggesting then, I'll come to you in just a minute, Andy, uh, are you suggesting then that um, we should maybe, in the first instance, mm -hmm. look at our current stage one, stage two, pre-legislative, um, uh, the, the way that we deal with those things and adjust those first, have a good look at that and, and focus in on that, bring in some of the improvements or whatever that, that you and others are suggesting to actually um, get that right first. And that might, in a sense, be part of what you're suggesting, and I think John suggested that that would, that would be a kind of self-limiting mechanism that would actually then reduce the amount of legislation possibly. But uh, we need to get, maybe get that right <coughs> first, is that what you're saying, yeah. before we can look at the following stages, is that? that that's absolutely correct, yeah. I think you've yeah. summarised that, uh, that, that very well. I mean, that, that's not to imply that this is criticism of of uh, the uh, the current process or those who actually partake of it. Um, and it's always easy from the outside looking in to actually make uh, commentary and not like, like that. Uh, but I suppose that the, the legislation that comes along and is right uh, for Andy to actually set out and to identify that and there's a significant amount of legislation that actually comes comes your way. But the legislation that's looked at on the face of it, in effect, without maybe, probably because of the time constraints that you've actually got, maybe able to exert the challenge uh, that perhaps you could do in other circumstances about the extent to which that legislation is, in fact, um, necessary. That uh, sometimes is actually taken as read. In previous submissions in, in, in different papers, we've actually... Um, suggested that the, the responsibility perhaps should um, rather than necessarily just sit with the uh, committee with parliament or with government actually be at the earliest possible stage uh, when uh, proposals are actually made because legislation usually have their roots in uh, a party political manifesto uh, which might be something as simple as a, as a promise and I think there's maybe a strong case at that point and this is perhaps straying from our discussion if you like for, for the uh, the, the proposals at that point to be properly costed and to have a, a different basis, uh, meaning that by the time it actually reached the government programme, uh, there is a firmer basis for uh, what is a, a political promise uh, in effect. But I, I accept that that's perhaps a bit controversial for Fully the next election. Fully manifesto <laughs> short for <laughs> 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 Yes, I think that could yeah. lead to some interesting situations. Mm -hmm. um, Andy, then Fiona. I think that uh, John raises a, a vitally important. Uh, point and, and, and Don is providing a partial answer, but there is one important step in the pre-legislative procedure between uh, fully costed manifestos and uh, stage one and stage two or other uh, pre-legislative stages of bills. And that is um, the decisions that are made about the legislative programme before Parliament, because it strikes us as we watch the way in which the Parliament has operated that in fact um, the Scottish Parliament has adopted a very, very Westminster based model. Um, it has taken a model which says that the vast majority of the programme is brought forward by the government. In other words, the executive branch is bringing forward the legislation and the legislature just has to very much put up with what it's given. There is no serious discussion at a, as a legislature. There's no consultation before that legislative programme is decided on. In Westminster fashion, it's brought to you in uh, a chunk at the beginning of the parliamentary session and then usually at the, the, the first meeting in September thereafter. And it's sort of given to you in chunks. And it may be a terribly radical suggestion but it may be that as a legislature, as a lawmaking body, that um, you should um, consider whether 
you actually need to, con to, to, to look at the size and shape of that legislative programme in more detail across all the parties, across all the manifestos within Parliament to decide which areas of the law need to be brought up to date most, which areas of the law most need attention. Because these discussions at the present moment are going on very much inside government and then they come and they lay the results in front of you. And it is not coming from Parliament and the MSPs discussing in advance what they think are the most pressing legal problems, what areas of the law most need reviewed. And it feeds into the whole scrutiny business because the scrutiny and legislative functions are um, uh, inextricably interlinked. But um, in other parliaments around the world, and this is another reason perhaps for some wider study, there is more input from members of the legislature uh, into the programme of, legislature, uh, of legislation that that parliament is going to deal with. Um, and there is less control by the executive branch. And these ideas were discussed back in the days of the Constitutional Convention uh, uh, and across Scotland and in the CSG. Um, and we don't have a situation where we have, you know, a real separation of powers between the three classical branches of government. But actually thinking on that model might actually be really helpful in moving forward in establishing a balance between um, the, 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 the legislative and scrutiny functions which you have to perform and overall might actually elevate the Scottish Parliament within the system um, taking, dare I say it, a little bit of the power away from the executive branch and back into yourselves and this building. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Fiona? Uh... That's a lot to think about. Um, but can I go back? Yes. And I can't think about it just now. I <laughs> um, want to go back to the model because I am... And I don't... I, I'm going to sound as if I'm being very negative about this and I'm not. But I'm just thinking, you know, in terms of the procedures we've got at the moment, yeah. how do we have to change them radically to do this, or do they actually fit into this model? We're just using different terms. And I was thinking about the post-legislative bit now, because Dawn said committees do a lot of inquiries, but they don't do post-legislative scrutiny. But my experience of being on a committee is often that an inquiry is actually post-legislative scrutiny. We just don't call it that. You know, something comes up that hasn't worked properly, and so the committee says, let's do an inquiry into that. They don't say, let's look at that legislation and scrutinise it. They just say, let's take this incident. So do we actually currently have the structures and are we doing it? I think that's what I'm asking again. But do we have to just be clearer that that is what we're doing? Uh, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah. Now I'll come back to you. I think that... Um you're right to, to highlight uh, the, the inquiries which uh, we've, we've all uh, referred to or referred to earlier. Um, I don't think all of them, I think I'm right in saying, would, would fit in neatly to the, uh, the description of post-legislative uh, inquiry. Some of them, uh, or uh, scrutiny, some of them undoubtedly do. That, that's um, certainly the, the case. Um, you, you're right also to actually highlight that, that you do elements of, of this. They are probably not as structured as that and there is probably um, limited evidence that there are plans at the outset when legislation has been introduced Fiona that there will be post legislative uh, review later on by way of an inquiry the inquiries uh, from our experience tend to come along as, as a consequence of um, maybe perceived service failure perceived um, excess cost um, public opinion um, a whole host of re reasons um, rather than as a, a, a structured requirement of the passing of, of legislation. The time that you apply to, to inquiries, and, and this, maybe this is the, the thing to, to debate, it may well be that um, having a different um, approach to 
the time that you apply to inquiries, um, it may well be that the resources and time is actually there. But yeah, you call you call it something different, and it's tagged on specifically to say a piece of legislation or an initiative, which might be some years previously in effect. But what that would actually mean is that um, in say three, five, or whatever the determined time scale is, years time that your work programme will set aside X number of sessions to consider this piece of, of legislation. And coming back to, to the point about um, what you do um, presently and uh, trying to, as far as possible, neutralise the extent to which um, you're, you're overburdened, I would see much of the, the requirement for this falling to government, in effect, that you will undertake the scrutiny role. But I, I wouldn't see it as the committee's role to actually um, undertake um, consideration of all, all the evidence because when legislation is actually being passed, the government should be making it clear, in our opinion, the extent to which you will be provided with information on an ongoing basis so that you can actually undertake your scrutiny role on an ongoing basis so that there is clarity throughout the course of the legislation, not just at the end, about performance, about service performance, about the performance of legislation as well. And that would mean then that your post-legislative scrutiny uh, will have been informed by not only the, the pre-legislative scrutiny, but ongoing scrutiny as well, so that the parcel of information that is being compiled will have been compiled over a period of, of years. Uh, but the bulk of that will be coming as a consequence of uh, the information uh, compiled and determined by government as well. Uh, Mark, I think you wanted to come in. I wanted to just come back to Fiona McLeod's point about sort of where this fits within the existing legislative procedures. I think the existing stage one procedure does provide an opportunity to set out um, whether, how, when and against what criteria you might conduct post-legislative scrutiny if the Parliament to ask lead subject committees to, to, to give their views as to whether this merited post-legislative scrutiny over what sort of timescale, because timescales will clearly vary depending on the nature of the legislation, then that might be, provide a marker to sort of at least give a, a framework against which future committees in, in either future sessions of the Parliament or in, later in the session could conduct post-legislative scrutiny as, as part of an individual inquiry. I think, and this comes back to something Don Peebles said, said earlier, um, there's also an awful lot of um, secondary legislation that goes through that is going to be slightly more challenging, perhaps, to kind of pick up um, scrutiny of that, which, which may be very, very significant. And we've, we've illustrated an example within our, our written submission. Um, so mustn't get sort of solely trapped into thinking it's solely about primary legislation. Um, and then there's also the, the perhaps even more complex picture position of how to deal with the cumulative effect of multiple pieces of legislation, how all those add up together. Um, and again, echoing something that, that Don Pe People said, that's a sort of proactive approach to planning future post-legislative scrutiny. There will always be the sort of reactive things, things which come up which were unexpected, and the time would have to be factored into for those sorts of things, which things which may never have been an issue at the time the leg legislation was passed may emerge owing to public concerns think other circumstances. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Fiona, did I see you wanting to...? Yeah, because I think that leads us nicely on to what would be the triggers for post-legislative scrutiny, which is something we've discussed in the committee. Are there any...? Do you think we've covered that and what you've been seeing already? Um, actually, yeah. I'm done, then, Andy. Okay. So, sorry, Don, do you want to...? So I thought Andy was... Right, Andy, no, okay. no, if yeah. Don wants to go, I'll <coughs> come after him. <laughs> Hold um, the jacket stick. Don, <laughs> <laughs> you first. Okay, yeah, that's clear. Yeah, I think that um, in terms of the the, the triggers, I, feel, I mean, if we start with time scale um, and think about the, the extent of which um, the legislation be looked at, um, it, it's going to be difficult, I think, to actually pinpoint say a period, albeit the, the UK um, UK government, the UK House of Parliament has actually set three years uh, for assessment of uh, primary legislation. Um, I think they said that in 2008, although they haven't actually uh, met, met that. That seems early uh, to me. Um, when you actually start talking about timescales, you end up then talking about arbitrary uh, uh, figures, almost whether it be three, whether it be five, or, or, or uh, whatever. Um, I suppose that uh, initially there will have to be the will um, that, that's there to actually undertake the, the, the legislation. There will have to be a bit of leadership, I suppose, from 
uh, the individual committees um, on on that. Um, it's going to be determined by the ex expected impact of legislation as well, because some legislation that's passed may not have um, longer or considerations of uh, outcomes or impact um, until considerably um, a number of years have passed, potentially. Um, so it may well be that there are longer time frames for, uh, for some um, elements of, of legislation uh, rather than, than others. Um, the, uh, the requirements to actually undertake that legislation, however, could potentially be set out depending on whether it's primary or whether it's secondary. And it may well be that uh, that's, that's something for us to, to debate, that the type of thing that you would actually look at on the basis that yeah, if you actually do it. Now, I suppose that uh, I'd be interested to know um, what actually prompts an inquiry, and if an inquiry is actually part of a post-legislative uh, review, what is it that the committee considers that would actually under, uh, require it to actually undertake uh, an inquiry? That would be useful to, to know and perhaps to, to tease out in this discussion, and perhaps that can be channeled into potentially the the model that we're actually speaking about or the process that we're potentially going to speak about as well. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Andy. I think the decisions as to what's going to trigger uh, post-legislative scrutiny are always going to lie with the committees uh, themselves and um, how much time and resource MSPs have to put into it, which comes back to my suggestion of setting time specifically for scrutiny purposes uh, and, and balancing legislation and scrutiny. But the things uh, which might trigger um, MSPs' decisions as to post-legislative post scrutiny I'd put into three categories following the, the, the evidence which we submitted. Um, the first is that consideration can be given to um, the equivalent of the sunset clauses, which we all talk about quite frequently, that you actually write into the bill after five years or after ten years or after whatever period you decide, um, this act will be fully reviewed. Um, and you have the opportunity to do that with every piece of legislation. I'm not sure if you would want to do it with every piece of legislation, uh, but important pieces of legislation, the Marine Act or the Climate Act, uh, the Climate Change Act, or uh, lots of other pieces of legislation that we as an organisation <coughs> have been uh, involved in working with you on, um, it might have been a very good idea to put in such a, 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 a statutory review of the legislative efficacy. Um, the other uh, thing which I think it would be good for committees to look at is uh, scrutiny during the implementation of that Act, or of any Act. Uh, and during the process of passing it, it may well be worth considering um, how much scrutiny is going to be required that the executive then goes away and properly delivers it. Because in our evidence, we suggest that Parliament has, has done some really good scrutiny work when it's actually got down to it with uh, the uh, Climate Change Act and the Land Use Strategy. They called in uh, the, the documents that were being sent out on the Land Use Strategy. And effectively, Parliament said to the government, this isn't what we asked for. We asked for something that was much stronger. Could you strengthen it, please? And uh, the next iteration of the, the, the document that finally was passed using a, a secondary instrument into law was much, much stronger, much improved, because Parliament had actually set aside time to, imp to intervene at an early stage, having scrutinised what was going on in the executive. So I think that that's a second important uh, way in which Parliament uh, can, can, can do it. And I, I, I would praise uh, the, the, the Rural Affairs uh, Climate Change and Environment Committee for the work that they've just been doing on the Marine Act, where they have been looking before the orders are brought forward and before the marine protected areas and the marine plan are brought forward by executive, they've been checking on progress. And I think that that has been a very, very effective parliamentary scrutiny operation, uh, which has a great effect on, 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 on the executive branch sitting up on the hill. And lastly, this question of policy inquiries. 
when, when you set up a policy inquiry, you're quite right in, 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 in our view that you are doing post-legislative scrutiny because you have to look at the, the legislative framework uh, which the, 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 prog the policy you're looking at is, is hung on. Uh, and you have to almost inevitably consider whether uh, fresh statutory legislation or fresh secondary instruments are required to actually redirect the way that public policy is being run. And um, again, uh, this Parliament has, on the few occasions when it has entered the field of public scrutiny, been able to make a real difference. The, the 78 or 70 odd um, pieces of legislation, sometimes conflicting in the marine environment, were brought together into the Marine Act, which is one of the, the in, in our view, one of the great works of the Scottish Parliament um, because of a parliamentary inquiry. Um, the Environment and Rural Development Committee in those days um, inquired into it and said, this is a mess, we need to bring this together. And um, we need to go back and get you know, a new foundation piece of legislation. And that's the genesis of, of, of the Marine Act. So these are crucially important from a public policy point of view, crucially important from our point of view that you have the time and the resources to actually do it. But you need a, a framework of, of, of uh, how the law works rather than one individual trigger, uh, we think. Thank you. Um, I, I presume that the your suggestion of a, a, a kind of the sunset clauses or some sort of mechanism whereby <clears throat> there would be a set time, depending on the legislation and so on, uh, as to when it should be reviewed, if that was implemented, and a number of acts and, and regulations for that matter um, had these these clauses built in over a period of time, uh, a number of years, that would serve to limit the ability of the executive to bring in new legislation because if something is passed now and there's a some kind of sunset clause or review clause built in that says in four years time we have to review this and that's done for everything when we get to four years from now and another government comes in and is looking at its legislative program it would have to take cognizance of the <coughs> reviews that were already built into the system which would take up space I suppose the, 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 the danger there um, would be that if you had so many of them, all you might be doing in one session of Parliament would be looking at reviewing legislation that had been <coughs> approved previously, and you wouldn't have any room for new legislation. So, you know, I could see some potential difficulties there. Uh, anyone have any comments on that? Well, that's the extreme that you would have no time at all for that. But I suppose that where we are at the moment is that... Uh, more and more legislation comes before Parliament without that to review, so it's almost an incremental effect that uh, the consequence of all of that is we end up with a lot or more legislation than we actually had at the start of uh, any parliamentary session in effect. So whilst there is a risk, it, I accept that it might not get though, to, to the extreme that uh, you, you've actually uh, uh, described. I, as I said in my earlier comments, I don't think that you would really want to put that into every bill, although you would always be able to know what was coming up. You'd, you'd, ha you'd have a schedule and uh, you'd, you'd be able to deal with it. You, 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 and I dare say that a parliamentary committee could decide, well, actually, on a, on, on, on a brief glance, uh, this is working fine and we don't need to run a full inquiry, or to, to look at it and say, actually this is not working the way that we intended it uh, as the Parliament when we passed the law uh, and, and it does need a full inquiry. So you'd be able to manage the system, I think, uh, although I, I stress again that uh, it, 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 it might not be a good idea to put a, a review clause into every piece of legislation. We would only really suggest it for, for important, fairly major pieces of legislation which you're passing. Um, but would one other way to deal with it be to the trigger <coughs> for the trigger be that it would have to be considered, but not an absolute mm -hmm. uh, requirement to review. Yes. So the trigger would be that a particular committee or whoever would, would, would consider it, form a view as to whether there was a need for further work or not. That might limit yeah. it. You're the MSPs yeah. and you're passing the law. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the last point that I'd make, though, here is that... Um, 
There are many major bills. The Environmental Assessment Bill for strategic environmental assessment of all the policies, programmes uh, 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 and, and plans of government uh, was passed by Parliament and I don't think it has ever been looked at again. Um, you know, there are pieces of legislation which are, are, are fairly critically important which at the present moment just disappear or seem to just disappear. The processes are being run in, in, in government, but uh, that act applies to all public bodies, and I recently heard it suggested that no strategic environmental assessment has ever been carried out on uh, the uh, development plans in any of the 32 local authorities, and there's a suggestion that that should be done. Mm. Uh, there are other areas uh, where I'm, I'm fairly certain that strategic environmental assessments should have been carried out and they have not been carried out. But there has been no time for Parliament. I'm not blaming the MSPs and saying, you should have made time to scrutinise this. I mean, we do bring forward ideas as to what inquiries we think Parliament should make. But uh, there is a danger at the present moment of, of, of the sort of lazy fair um, uh, approach that we have, mm. that um, important pieces of legislation which uh, parliamentarians have spent considerable amounts of time on then just slide off into, in, into obscurity and are never looked at again, yeah. uh, which, which, which seems like a terrible waste of MSP's time. Okay, thank you. Helen? I was only going to offer that um, in the context of the health board, direct elections to health boards, uh, a sunset clause was built into that, and that came about because there was recognition by the politicians around the table that there was acute political sensitivity to this, and this would need to be reviewed again <coughs> in due course. So my uh, recollection was that the uh, peg for that was set at five years. And uh, I think likewise with the um, hedge, High Hedges Bill, mm -hmm. um, I think there was a sunset clause yeah. built into that. So I think you know, there's an element there of MSPs already recognising that there's sensitivities out there that needs to be monitored mm -hmm. carefully. And so I think there's a, a degree of um, an expectation that the civic society would expect MSPs to anticipate that kind of sensitivity. Uh, but at the same time, there's also legislation that we're aware of that some of it has never been changed in 100 years. Yeah. So, you know, we have to have a balancing act of thinking, <coughs> you know, do we do that faster, the 100 years legislation, or do we do the one in five years' time? So it's always a, a very tricky one, and we ha always have to gauge by what the public's expectations are out there and what the public actually wants us to be delivering. It's not just entirely what we want to do or what the executive wants to do, it very much depends on the demand by the public as well. Fiona, I think you want to do. Right, I'm going to ask Mark Roberts if we can, in terms of triggers for post legislative scrutiny, if we could move, is, is there a way of moving beyond fixed dates, as in sunset clauses, um, views on policy, and is there a way that we can use data as a trigger? You know, to show that there is there are facts and figures and numbers that tell us the legislation needs look, looked at. Is there a way we could do that? Well, Mark, do you want to answer that? I think I think in terms of, of data, this comes back to my original answer to, to Richard Lyle's last question about kind of having high quality baseline data against which to assess performance at the point at which you start, and then at uh, whatever point in the future you wish to review the legislation. Um, but it's having that data in place early on is, is critical to do that. Um, if you're starting to see service delivery failure or performance decreasing and your quantitative information shows you that, then that might be something that triggers um, a need for a review to happen. Um, I suspect if that happens, then, then, then MSPs and members of the committee will, will hear about that anyway um, before the, kind of the, um, the, the, the data kicks in. So that will become the sort of reactive um, trigger I was talking about earlier that, that might sort of engender interest in a particular issue. Come back to the questions of, of timescales and fixed timescales. Um, I don't think we're, we're, we're totally convinced that a fixed timescale is, is, is necessarily the, the right way to go. Um, different pieces of legislation have very different purposes. Andy mentioned earlier on um, the Climate Change Act, which sets targets for the next 40, 40 years. Um, that has a very, very different requirement to say something where there's a sort of um, perhaps something like protection of vulnerable groups suite of legislation where you want it to be working now 
Um, so you may want to review that at a shorter time scale than perhaps something which was extending over a longer period of time. Um, so I think there is probably a horses for courses issue about, about time scales. Okay, thank you. Don, I think you wanted in uh, Yeah, I, did, I just wanted to, to re-emphasise uh, the point that you're rightly making, um, convenient that we maybe didn't debate, is that, um, that whilst uh, um, there should be post-legislative scrutiny, um, it may not be that um, it takes the same format in, in every um, significant sense, because... Um, if we have a structured approach, what we will have then is a body of evidence which is built up over a period of time, and it may well be that the, the post-legislative scrutiny can be constrained to a review of the evidence um, so far. It may well be, however, that if that evidence is proven not to maybe imply that objectives have actually been achieved, and it may then lead to what we understand now to be a, an inquiry um, by the, the, the subject committee, um, which would, in effect, uh, resemble the post-legislative um, scrutiny. Yeah. Thanks for that. Maybe I can just pick up another thing. I think in your own submission as well, you mentioned um, the danger of any kind of post-legislative post scrutiny becoming a replaying of old arguments. Yeah. How do you actually prevent that from happening? I suppose that uh, the, the burden of responsibility for that will fall on um, the committee members and the parliamentarians themselves. They will have to um, adopt the uh, the role of scrutiny rather than uh, the one of politician, <laughs> if, if I may make that uh, distinction. I think it was the, uh, the Law Commission uh, made that uh, similar point in, in their 2006 paper, uh, that there has to be a fine line uh, between that, that um, the, uh, the pre-legislative scrutiny will have um, convinced you uh, that the, the case for legislation has, has been made. So irrespective of party political view, that the, the case for that will have been made in effect in, in this, this new format of, of scrutiny, say, this brand new world of, um, brave new world of, of scrutiny. So that, that case will have been made. And when it comes to the point of legislation, it's on that basis, accepting that that case has actually been made, to actually take the objective viewpoint and consider whether or not the objectives of that legislation um, have actually been achieved against the background of the evidence um, that uh, has actually been presented by government, by public witnesses, by, by whomsoever. So, uh, but the, the responsibility for that will certainly fall uh, to the, uh, the committee members. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine yeah. it would be quite difficult yeah. to set criteria to limit uh, a committee and, and you know that would decide to, to look at something because committees guard very jealously their right to do what they need to do in, in relation to their remits. I suppose what, what we're talking about here is that there would be guidance that they should be looking at not so much the why of the legislation but the how, mm -hmm. how it's actually worked, <coughs> yeah. not why it was implemented in the first place. But I think it might be quite difficult to restrain parliamentarians from drifting into yeah. uh, the, the, the why arguments. And certainly the many strengths that you have in that regard, it may well be that the, the, there is no advantage to, to restraining that completely um, in effect because the, the, the skills that, that, that you have in effect of why you're, you're actually here and we want them to be brought to bear. I suppose that what we're really um, agreeing on is that uh, there will be a clearer set of evidence for you to actually assess and to actually consider uh, the worth uh, or the, the achievement of the, the legislation, whereas um, at the moment, again, if we make the comparison with the, uh, the, the inquiries, in effect, you're, you're offering it as a general call for evidence and you're not necessarily have an expectation of what may come in, if anything. Uh, the difference with, um, a, a diff or with a new approach will be that uh, you will already have a body of evidence provided probably by, by government and in your inquiry will be perhaps seeking to establish additional further or perhaps corroborating evidence to what has already been provided as part of that review and or inquiry. Yeah. Andy? Uh, very briefly, I, I think this uh, issue again comes back to the amount of resource that is at the disposal of each committee and that if uh, there were greater staff resources and greater resources in terms of advice, expertise and research behind each committee, then uh, all of these matters would be eased, but this one in particular, because you would be able to get your staff to go away and produce a report. Tell us, you know, in, in, in fundamentally, how is this piece of legislation that we have to review uh, going? 
Is it, are there any serious considerations across the policy community? Is there anybody shouting uh, that, in fact, we've got to reopen old battles because the, the, the matter didn't work? And you can get an assessment from advisors or, 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 or researchers in those matters to be able to make fairly swift decisions because, I, you know, with 129 MSPs, we're still at this point where you're going to have a massive workload. Um, so I think actually that this is where the, the resource point is perhaps most acute. Yeah, I, I could see how that might work um, insofar as, uh, you know, if there were enough staff resources or, or resources to, to fund advisors to go, to go away and look at something and to do what we're doing here just now. So mm. that this would be done by advisors and staff and so on, speaking to folk like yourselves, pulling together everything and coming back with a, a fairly succinct and, and, and targeted a uh, report, you know, recommending as to, you know, wh whether it had been working okay or whether there was more work, more work needed. Um, I could see there might be some um, an advantage in that. Obviously, there are cost implications and so on, and that's a difficulty, you know, at any time, but particularly, I think, uh, I think just now. Um, the other thing that strikes me there is that one of the benefits that MSPs get from actually engaging in this process themselves is that we get to hear the detail from yourselves. We can begin to form in our own minds views as to what might work, where we might want to go, what, what wouldn't work. So there are big advantages for us in engaging in this sort of discussion our, ourselves. Um, so, you know, that would be one of the downsides. If we were only coming at it at the end and we were getting our report presented to us, which we had to plough through, that's not quite the same as getting a feel for the issues and the subject, you know, uh, speaking to folk like yourselves. I think importantly that's because we need to look at scrutiny as being um, whole life and uh, rather than just at the start and at the end, which is perhaps where we are, that there is a, a scrutiny role throughout the, the, the period, the course of the, the legislation on an ongoing basis, which is probably about holding government to, to account and actually seeking the evidence from, from them on an ongoing basis uh, rather than building up to the, what's perceived as the end. Members have any other points? Uh, anyone else? Want to, uh, Mark, do you want to come in? I just, just wanted to, to raise the point about the sort of role of Audit Scotland in this and how it might be able to contribute. contribute. The, the performance audits that we publish and which the Auditor General brings to the Public Audit Committee, some of those actually kind of fall within the sort of category of post legislative mm -hmm. scrutiny and we made reference to a um, report on free personal nursing care we published a few years back. We've previously done work on kind of reform of the planning system, which had come as a result of a large amount of, of legislative change. So some of those things feed into the, the post-legislative scrutiny agenda, and of course those, that's one way into the Parliament to provide information. But of course those, those look at, at finance, at performance, at value for money issues. They stop short of up questioning the policy principles behind a piece of legislation, as Andy Miles was talk, talking about earlier. And not all of them fall into that category. Some of them are, are kind of on wider public um, issues of public policy issues and not explicitly tied to individual pieces or sets of legislation. Yeah, thank you. Just a question, Kimberly. I apologise mm -hmm. if you've covered it's it. Just right. stop me in my tracks if you have. And it was in terms of the evidence that was submitted to us about the Wales um, situation. Um, I was wondering if it's uh, if I could expand on that a little bit more because it was uh, interesting to read that you had modernised the system working with them and I'd just be glad to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, um, you're right, we did. Okay, or, 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 don't, don't. That's fine, that's okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or, or questions that, that member? George? Yeah, just when we were talking, I was on the Public Audit Committee for the first year or so that I was here, and comparing it to a similar role I had in the local authority, where there was a more, it was a, it was an audit committee and a scrutiny committee, would there not be some scope to possibly look at the Public Audit Committee to maybe expand it and make it not just about pounds, shillings and pence, but also the scrutiny as well? Because a lot of the trigger mechanisms that we've talked about today would be inquiries, the petitions committee, uh, various other committees as well, and a lot of your reports from Audit Scotland. So would there not be a, a prospect? Somebody in the Public Audit Committee would probably hate this idea, but is there not a prospect for that? I think. I don't know if I can fully answer that question. I mean, as I think it, it's primarily a, a question for the Parliament. Currently, the Public Finance and Accountability Act sort of 
limits the um, coverage of our, our reports to kind of looking at the questions of economy, efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and therefore, we, we don't get into the, the, the policy questions. Um, and the, the public audit model is kind of built around, around that sort of limitation and that the scrutiny of the wider policy issue can, is done elsewhere. I mean, is, but being on the public audit committee, it was the politicians that ended up going down to the actual policy issues when we were debating it as well. So it would make, in my eyes, it would make sense if you're going to have a post-legislative scrutiny, that might be the place to have it as well, you know. It's I think, I mean, our, our, our role as currently convicted is, is very much about how that policy is being implemented and whether there, it is delivering value for money and um, what it was intended to do rather than going back as far as to say, well, was that the correct policy to make? I think that would be a question for the, for the Parliament to consider whether it wanted to change that. So. Andy? Uh, across the years, one of the uh, committees of a legislature which I've uh, had experience of is the Environmental Audit Committee uh, in the Commons at Westminster. And it does the kind of policy auditing that uh, you're suggesting might be added to, 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 to the audit committee's uh, fairly static uh, function uh, it, within the Scottish Parliament. And uh, our experience is that that uh, process that's been run through the Environmental Audit Committee has been hugely beneficial in uh, drawing an environmental focus onto policies which are not you know, just in the environmental box. So they've been able to look across the policy spectrum and that's been extremely useful in trying to integrate government functions. But if you gave the entire lot for environmental, social and economic policy functions to one committee, I think they would um, die of overload. <laughs> so it, I think it's a good idea, but I think that uh, in the Scottish Parliament with fewer members, the policy audit function that you're talking about probably has to remain with uh, the subject committees in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, th these, these questions of uh, the integration of government uh, and, and audit uh, from, 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 from one area to others um, are, are something that we've discussed in Governance Matters, the, the, the report which we produced on uh, our experience of the first three years of the Parliament. But um, I, th there is an enormous job to do there, uh, is the, the only advice that I would give looking at the example uh, of what's happened in Westminster. Well, I think um, that that's probably, you know, uh, dealt with the subject pretty fully. It's been very, very useful, I would have to say. I thank uh, all of you for coming along and giving us uh, your submissions and, and, and uh, your contributions this morning. We've got another session in, in, in a couple of weeks where we'll continue to tease this out. But a lot of very interesting ideas and suggestions have come out of that today, um, which we will have a look at. Uh, so I would just like to thank you all very much uh, and uh, we'll maybe just um, suspend for a, a minute or two just to allow <coughs> people to leave. Thank you very much.
Okay, members, if we can uh, reconvene and move on to Agenda Item 5. <coughs> uh, this is to do with the, the first monitoring report and activities of cross-party groups since the review. As you'll see, uh, the paper demonstrates that the new monitoring system uh, is now a more robust process. The vast majority of cross-party groups are now routinely providing more detailed information on their activities and finances and annual returns to Parliament. Now, there are still a few groups that aren't providing this information or are not meeting at least twice a year. But you have an opportunity today to have a look at this uh, report and we can decide how we want to, to deal with that. Um, do members have any general comments? I would um, intend to go through Annex B page by page. Um, do you have any general comments before we, we do that? Did you see a, a yes, um, an Annex B, I think, is the crucial yeah. is the crucial part of it. Um, there's the general report which summarises things before that, but I think uh, if you maybe we'll just go through um, the, the first few pages. If you have any general comments, and then we can go through Annex B. Okay with it, yeah, Fiona. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say thank you very much to the, the clerk who went through this huge mm -hmm. bundle of stuff. I thought it was really, really useful to get the summary because I got as far as China before I realised someone had summarised it for me. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. This is, I think this has been really instructive and helpful. OK, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> well, page one in the report, anything in particular there that members wish to pick up on? Page two. Page three. Page four, Fiona, yeah. Um, the fact that one cross-party group is currently in abeyance, uh -huh. could I ask what that actually means? Are you a cross-party group or not? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when it says in abeyance. <coughs> yeah, yeah. I think that they are considering their future. Mm -hmm. I think that that is the issue. Um, because, yes, you, once you're a cross-party group, you're a cross-party group until you cease being a cross-party group. And uh, So we would hope to hear from them quite quickly, I think, um, to find out just what their plans for the future are. OK. Um, if we go into page five... The, Margaret? Yeah, it says there's groups that have not met for a year. Uh -huh. and we've got some recommendations then. There. Yeah. If we could maybe, uh, actually, I think that if we go through Annex B, <coughs> we can pick up on those okay. specific ones and we can decide what action we wish to take in relation to these because a number are not fully complying. I would have to say that the, the level of compliance now compared to what it was is much, much better. And I'm, I'm really pleased with the way that uh, the review has worked. And I think the fact that we're doing... Um, a six monthly report now rather than an annual look at these things has helped. The fact that the, the clerks now have a more proactive role in relation to making sure that, that groups are actually doing what they need to do is all working together to improve the, the, the system. So I'm very, very pleased about that. Sorry, convener, can I go back to, I don't know if this is maybe coming up in the annex as well, but in page four, we've got the beer in Bruin cross-party group currently has only three MSP members. Yeah, I think that... Is that, that considered that, cross-party group um, then? I think that's picked up in the annex as it's well, so we'll, we'll, well. Come, okay. we'll come to that in the, in the detail. So if we could actually move to... Yeah. Just one more general point on paragraph 21. I think it's really good to see how many cross-party groups are holding joint meetings. Yeah. Um, and I think we should praise them for that and yeah. support them in that. Absolutely. I think we should encourage joint meetings as, as much as we as much as we can. If we can move on to page nine then, which is uh, Annex B, and if we can just run through um, the annex in terms of um, of meetings, uh, you'll, you'll see that um, there are 72 groups there that have met once in 2000 and th 2013. Uh, but we're obviously early in the year um, already, and a number have their their meetings uh, sh scheduled. Uh, a number of groups haven't met this year at all and have no meetings scheduled. But again, 
they've got quite a bit of time to um, to do that. It does concern me, though, that four groups <coughs> have not met for over a year. Now, the Beer and Brewing Group, which was mentioned, uh, hasn't met since it was formed on the 29th of June 2011. The Cooperatives Group <coughs> hasn't met again but, since... But they've got an AGM scheduled, I believe, further on, it says here in the notes. The Co-op Group, um, is it? Yes, they've got one scheduled for the 29th of May next week. Uh -huh. Where's that, Helen? It's uh, on page 11. Oh, yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the, the fact remains that um, it's nearly two years since they met. So, uh, no, you know, no, I don't think uh, so June, June 2000 says it has not met since the initial meeting on the 29th of June 2000. Yes. So um, that's the beer, the beer one. Sorry. Yeah, and yeah, it, 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 it says the same for the co-op co group. Uh, I'm sure that's wrong because I'm uh -huh. sure I've been at a meeting since then. Maybe, yes. maybe the paperwork have been brought up today. Ah. But I'm sure I've been at a meeting of that of the court. Court. So, and since June 2011. James Kelly as well, yes. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Well, we could perhaps uh -huh. check to see if they have actually met. Um, no. Well, the clerks are telling me that they're not aware of a meeting. They haven't been informed of a meeting. It hasn't mm -hmm. been posted in the website. So, mm -hmm. you know, we. The, if, if they have met and, and they haven't complied with these things, then we need to um, deal with that. Uh, the Park Homes uh, group hasn't met since January of last year, and the Sexual Health group hasn't met since February of last year. Um, now, what do members feel we should do in relation to this? We can obviously check to see if the cooperative group has uh, met, um, but if it has and it hasn't complied with the requirements of the code, then do we want to write to them just to remind them as to what they should do, and um, you know, make tell, ask them to make sure that they uh, comply in future? Helen, um, I think it'd be good to check out the facts first of all, because mm -hmm. my recollection was that the last big occasion that they had. I was in the garden foyer last year, mm -hmm. um, so I, and that had been organised by the CPG. But I just would want that to be checked. Uh -huh. um, but then, if it turns out that it's correct, the information that we have in front of us, then yeah. you're right. Yeah, um, yeah. People need to be advised. Um, yes. I, I, I think that it would be right to write to them and um, you know say that you know they need to give account of themselves yeah, yeah. Um, and then it needs to be brought back to the committee to decide then what to do mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. there is no intention to meet but I mean I think the very fact that they've got um, before us the AGM for next week shows that something's happening but I'm certain I attended uh -huh. um, last year mm -hmm. um, that, that, the, Would that have been an event in the <coughs> Parliament rather than a meeting of the cross-party group it would, possibly? It would have been organised by the ah, cross party yeah, and I'm virtually yeah. certain it was because James Kelly is one of the co-conveners I think mm -hmm, I'm right mm -hmm. in saying there. So if, if we check with them to find out exactly mm -hmm. what's happened yeah. and get a report back to the next meeting yes, of, yes. Of, of, the, of the committee yeah. on that one. Um, as far as the beer and brewing industry group is concerned it hasn't met for nearly two years. Uh, again do we uh, what do we want to do about that? Um, I know that they've also um, they have a problem with number of MSPs as well. Uh, Margaret, do you want to comment yeah. on this one? Yeah, I mean the notes say they've only got three. They don't have cross party support. So are they technically allowed to call themselves a cross party mm. group? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so basically, again, I think we should write to to them, um, reprimanding them for not having met and basically asking them to clarify whether they wish to continue as a group and if they don't get their house in order pretty soon then we should um, remove them uh, as a cross-party group. Would members be happy with that? Fiona? Yeah. yeah, I think I would agree. Mm -hmm. I think we have to write to them, all of them, that we have concerns about in the first instance. If they're not happy with the responses, I think we should invite the conveners to come mm -hmm. and give us their evidence if we're not happy with the Would you want response. to invite the conveners, <coughs> just, just get the conveners along to I explain? I think we should give them or? the opportunity in writing first. Yeah. Yeah. And if yeah. we're not happy with the response, yeah. mm -hmm. because I think in the setting yeah. up of the cross-party yeah. groups, inviting the conveners for the new cross-party groups has been, mm. I think that's been a really, really good thing. 
yeah. you know, the, the cross party groups are taking it really seriously. So I think yeah. write to them in the first instance, mm -hmm. give them the opportunity, and if we're not happy, mm -hmm. then ask them mm -hmm. to come. Are, are members happy with that yes. approach? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's do that. Can, can I? On you go, Dick. To you, convener. Can I, I, I as a, a chairman or, or, or convener of a cross party group, I'm finding it very hard with the requirement of the code. It says groups must hold two meetings per year. One of these must be the AGM. Meetings of the group must be announced in advance via the Parliament website with meeting details notified to the standards class of at least 10 days calendars, calendar days in advance. Now, I, I nearly, we nearly fell foul of the, the group that I have because of the fact that the, the meeting we intended to have over the period of time came the Christmas period, which is one of the busiest periods for the Showman's Guild. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it fares yeah. all over. Uh, if you appreciate that, and uh, trying to pin the uh, pin down to get a date, but also the other problem, and I'm rec now recognised with so many groups and so many functions on in this parliament, trying to get a room in here on a, at a particular time and a particular day is getting harder and harder. Mm. So I wonder if the 10 day calendar days, um, you know. Should be should be shortened rather than ten clear calendar days because sometimes uh, I've had it that meetings have been cancelled mm -hmm. and trying to organise them they've been organised at short notice because we've been able to get a room but I'm not meeting the ten day count so technically I'm in breach of the code mm -hmm. and, and that's why uh, I'll flag that up for possible looking at. Yeah, later. Yeah. Helen, do you want to Just to say that maybe when um, the clerks are in contact with the committee convener or the um, cross party group conveners, um, members could be encouraged to set up calendar for the entire year, which is what we've done with our cross party groups, because then that way, um, you know, people at the first meeting in the year, um, people can flag up, if you have a discussion about your calendar of meetings, you can then flag up if there's difficulties, you, you would anticipate that some of your members would know that there's likely to be difficulties, so that's a good time, and then that enables you to put it into your own diaries. And one of the other benefits then is that you can try and avoid conflicts with other cross-party groups that you're very keen on, because if you see two on the same night that you're really keen on, you can maybe try and um, switch them around a bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think uh, we should encourage all groups to try and get their programme of meetings, you know, mm -hmm. done very, very early. There will be occasions, I suppose, when a cancellation has to happen, but if things are planned well in advance, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that reducing the 10 days would be a good idea, Dick. I think mm -hmm. 10 days isn't... I mean, just in terms of, of informing the public and, and you know, and, and others who might be interested to, you know... So. Just to flag it up. Yeah. 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 OK, thank you. OK, um, right. Oh, if we can move on to the next point here. Now, there were a number of groups, you'll see at the bottom of page 9 and the top of page 10, um, which didn't provide notification of their, their meetings. Uh, they have all been reminded, um, you know, that, that um, they should provide the, the 10 days notification that, that Dick was talking about there. Do we feel that's sufficient at the moment, or would we want to write as a committee to them to, re to remind them as a committee? Or do you feel the well, fact well, that... You know, the, the point, I'm, I'm glad to see that, that uh, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not the only culprit but one of the regular groups that meet in here, um, of which I'm a, a vice convener, the family is affected by imprisonment. I know they meet regular. Mm -hmm. and I know they, they advance. So it may be a factor that we are not reminding ourselves enough that we've got to inform uh, either by passing minutes or um, putting down to the point that Hell made, laying, laying down particular <laughs> dates so that it, it is basically the the, um, the, the standards uh, has been met. Mm -hmm. Are we happy to leave it at the moment that the, the clerks have already written, and if they continue to slip up, then that will be brought to our attention. I'll make sure I don't slip up. <laughs> in future, can be I'm glad to hear that. Dick. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> annual general meetings uh, is, is the next uh, point. And there's a the requirement they must hold an AGM once every 12 months. 
Now, you, you, you'll see there that um, uh, 82 groups in total, um, four are not yet required to hold an AGM. 32 groups uh, have held AGM, submitted their annual returns uh, as, as appropriate, and the clerks have written to others reminding them and 26 of the 46 groups have now held AGMs and have now provided their annual return forums. If you look at page 11, um, you'll see that um, a number of the groups will have held their AGMs by today. Uh, so if these are all gone ahead, then they've now complied. Others have got uh, AGMs scheduled uh, with, uh, within the next uh, few weeks. Um, but again, we come down to the beer and brewing and sexual health, who we've already agreed to write to, um, because they're, they're obviously not complying with, with any of this. Now, if we look at the CPG on park homes, they have said that they are awaiting the introduction of legislation before continuing the work of their group, and they have been advised that they need to hold an AGM regardless. seems rather bizarre that you would set up a group in anticipation of legislation which you don't know, uh, you know, when, when when that legislation is going to be coming in. So, I think they really need need to look at why they are set up. Um, if there are no ongoing issues for them to deal with, then why do they need to have a, have a group? Um, would you be uh, happy that we um, the committee writes to them as well as the fact that the clerks have advised them? Do we know if they have any plans for an AGM? They have scheduled one. Okay, uh, given that they've scheduled their AGM, are we happy to leave it at that at the moment and um, just keep an eye on what they do for the, ne the next... They arrange them anyway as part of the group on the page. Now. Yes, it did, hadn't made. That's, that, that's, that's true, Margaret. Yes, yeah. Um, and the CPG on Scots language is the group that is in has been in abeyance since December. They are con reconsidering their, their future uh, as a group, so we'll wait and hear uh, what they have to say. Um, <clears throat> now, the group in Dementia um, were due to hold their AGM the 22nd of May, and it was cancelled because of the resignation of the convener, Mark MacDonald, who stood down as a list MSP to take part in a by-election up in Aberdeen Donside. Um, so they need to, do they have a sufficient number of MSPs um, still on their group? You know, they have the minimum of five, even without Mark MacDonald. Yes, they, they do. do. Yeah. yeah. So they'll reschedule, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll be happy to, to allow them a wee bit of time uh, yeah. to do that. Um, and the, the Lupus CPG has dissolved. I was just going to suggest, convener, that the CPG um, and lupus, I mean, I, I think I'm right in saying that that would come under the category of musculoskeletal conditions. I'm not certain mm. about that, but it's something that um, should members, um, any of the members of the CPG, I'm sure, uh, could extend an invitation as convener of the uh, musculoskeletal, that if they wanted to switch yeah, to that, yeah. we'd be glad to, join to your take group. them. Yes, I'd be glad to take them on board. Okay. Well, I would be happy for you to do that, Helen. That's yeah, a very, you. very positive suggestion. Um, if we can just look quickly now at uh, page five, back, back to the recommendations. So we, we've looked at the, the general issues there, but um, are members content with the annual return form contained in Annex C of the paper, or would you wish any changes to that form? Or are you happy with it as it is? Yeah, you're, you're happy with that. And the second suggestion is that we should maybe issue supplementary guidance with a forum specifying the type of information, Fiona. For me, as I say, only got as far as China, but it was interesting how many for the benefit and kind section said that it didn't apply, it was nil, but when you looked and saw who their secretariat was, mm. you realised they should have been putting in something. Yeah. So I think yeah. we need guidance on that. So if the, if the clerks can produce guidance and take it to a future meeting, mm -hmm. and we can consider that. Okay. 
right oh well I think that's everything on the, the CPG um, review report uh, members happy with that yes okay if we can now um, move into private for the rest of the meeting